for today's lecture, it's going to be on clinical application or thermal modalities. So all the modalities that we kind of had talked about last lecture, uh, cryotherapy, thermotherapy, but very specific examples, how to set up a patient, some of the parameters that you would use to um, set up a patient and treat a patient with. So we're going to talk about ice, uh, heat, understanding different indications and contraindications, durations, dosages for thermal modalities, um, and understand and try to develop some clinical decision-making skills in selecting the best uh, thermal modality for each patient. So cold packs, most basic form of uh, cryotherapy that we use as athletic trainers, right? They're delivered by four different techniques, either the most common, the plastic bag filled with ice. Every athletic training facility has a Kramer bag or um, another brand that they rip off and they fill with ice and then you do the blow and suck technique, right? And you tie it off and you can form it to the body. Um, so that's the most common ice pack. You have reusable cold gel packs. You have a cold compression unit such as a Game Ready. That's a, a specific brand, but that's essentially what it is. And then you have chemical or instant cold packs. Um, I guess. So the reusable cold gel packs are ones that you can put in the uh, freezer and then place, when you want to place them on a patient, you usually put them in a pillowcase or some kind of barrier to uh, make sure you actually don't injure the patient. So these ones you can actually injure the patient a little bit with because of the temperature that these are, are uh, frozen at. Um, the material within the cold gel pack can actually uh, cause some burn on the patient. The cold compression unit, unit or a game ready, um, it's a device that you put ice and water in and you can set up a, the parameters to provide compression. Um, and the cold ice water that circulates through the compression that helps with the cold effects as well. Um, and then you have the chemical or instant cold packs. Uh, these are the most common ones that you see like in nurses' offices, at schools, um, and travel kits that you know, some of these travel teams may have and it might involve crushing it or squeezing it to crush it and the chemicals mix and make it cold. These you really do need a barrier because you can burn a patient with these because if the chemical pack leaks, that chemical can leak under your skin and not cause a chemical burn. Right? So the plastic bag filled with ice is the most common one that we use. Um, the, like I said last lecture, the best one to use is a ice with uh, crushed ice with a little bit of water, all right? Why you shouldn't use insulation. So using a towel or even a paper towel between skin and ice is not recommended because ice applied over an elastic wrap, so an ice wrap, would require a 109-minute treatment to decrease skin temperatures to a therapeutic range. Whoa, 109 minutes. That's a long time, right? almost two hours for the ice to be on the patient to reach the therapeutic range of cooling a specific temperature. But what you're going to have is the ice actually acts as an insulator and you can actually have increase in tissue temperature instead of the decrease in tissue temperature that you want. If you use a towel, you know, every outdoor training facility has towels in it, right? A towel required a 151 minute treatment. As I always say, that's over two hours. It's a two and a half hour movie. Might as well throw in a good movie, get some popcorn, watch a movie while you're icing. That is pointless. Who, like what patient, what athlete has two to two and a half hours to sit there and ice to reach the therapeutic range, right? So a lot of times you'll hear uh, in a busy athletic training facility, right? Patient might come in after practice and say, well, I got to go to the dining hall. It closes at seven. And I got 10 minutes to ice. Okay, well, at least 10 minutes is better than nothing. Well, throw the ice pack on for 10 minutes. Is that really bringing down the tissue temperature to a therapeutic range? Probably not. And you can see this chart here, skin temperatures during cold pack application. So insulator on the left and then the minimum skin temperature obtained uh, on the right here. So if you use no insulation, the minimum skin temperature 
that could ever be obtained is about 37.8, oh, 38 degrees, right? <coughs> a wet wrap. <laughs> so people have put uh, ace wrap in cold water and, you know, like a slushy water and wrap that around the patient before putting the ice back on, 48 degrees. And you can go down and you can see the different types of insulators, the dry towel and the sterile dressing. Sometimes we do actually use, especially the sterile dressing, um, over a fresh wound, say the patient just had an ACL reconstruction. We may use a sterile dressing over the wound or the ACL, uh, or where, the, where the sutures are, uh, but still do some kind of cryotherapy, like a game-ready unit, um, but we want to be sure as a precaution, right? So we want to be sure not to use it over open wounds, but a fresh surgical wound as well could be a precaution. So again, ice bags are the easiest, most efficient, and safest to use. Uh, the biggest cost here would be purchasing an ice machine. So crushed ice with a small amount of water uh, conforms the body the best. The best ice that anybody has is uh, Chick-fil-A has good ice. <laughs> and uh, so does Sonic. Sonic uh, has great ice. Um, that's the kind of ice you want to use. You don't want like the chunky ice because that can uh, actually poke into your skin a little bit. Um, reusable cold pack, same thing, contains a gel consisting of a silica in a form of antifreeze. So obviously antifreeze is not good for your body. Uh, so you want to use some kind of insulating medium, a wet towel, wet elastic wrap, or some kind of pillowcase. So this is when I worked in a physical therapy clinic when I first got out of college. The PTs would use these a lot. They had like a freezer, almost like a refrigerator freezer. They would, they would just have these reusable cold packs stacked up in. And... And, and I say this, common in PT clinic, so effectiveness diminishes when stored in ice chest for long periods. Why? So say I'm the first patient at 8 a.m., come in, I'm icing, you know, I ice for 20 minutes. That ice pack is nice and cold when it gets out of the freezer, but now as it's been on my body for 20 minutes, remember the, uh, the tissue, uh, not the tissue, the temperature gradient equalizes. So then maybe my therapist puts it back in, ice or in, in the uh, freezer five minutes later I take out that same ice pack to use on my second patient of the day and they ice for 20 minutes and then back in the cold unit for maybe 10 minutes and then back on the next patient for 15 minutes you see what I mean that that one ice pack isn't being able to it, it isn't being able to uh, being brought back up to its coldest tissue or coldest temperature yet in the freezer so by reusing that over a long period of time throughout the day, if you're the last patient of the day, you're going to have the least effective treatment, if you will, from that ice versus the first patient of the day, right? Risk of frostbite here because the pack uh, temp reaches below freezing. This is one of the only ones it does. And th these are examples of uh, cold packs, right? So this one is pretty big on the, uh, on the left side of the screen here. This thing is huge. You probably could use this on a whole whole body part, right? <laughs> whole back, your whole back, your whole hamstring. Um, most places don't actually buy them that big. This is a pretty common size here, the second one. Um, that would be good for a lumbar spine, shoulder. Even this one, this is a cervical collar um, ice pack. They call it cervical because this would reach down to the lower spine. This would go and wrap around the neck, so it would be wrapped around here, right? Um, ah, the game ready. You might not be able to see this picture. Whoop, this picture down here with the guy on, uh, with the ankle uh, device on here on the cold compression unit because my picture might be in the way. But a cold compression unit combines external compression with cold application. These are super popular. Like my wife's an athletic trainer, like I said before, at Williams College, and they have probably three or four of these in each of their athletic training facilities. I think they have three, they have four facilities. So they, they use these a lot. However, there's limited evidence on that the cold aspect of the compression unit actually reaches the therapeutic levels. The compression aspect is worth it, but the cold application doesn't really reach therapeutic levels that we know. Again, there's limited research out there. There, I believe, are, are more people doing research on this because they are becoming very popular. If you Google Game Ready, they actually have like a cryo cuff uh, for like the skull, which is crazy. They have, <laughs> they say, hey, oh, it helps with concussion, which I think is nuts. Um, 
So they, the unit itself is a couple of thousand dollars, about two to $2,500. Um, and each attachment is separate. So you can buy an ankle. They have a foot, ankle, lower leg one, I believe now. They have a knee, hip, uh, hand, wrist, they have a shoulder. Like I said, they have the skull one. They have a low back one now. Um, and each of those can run anywhere from two to, you know, six, eight hundred bucks. So buying a lot of these units um, can get expensive. The nice part is they are portable. So the dials are up front here. You can set the compression. You can set a uh, level from, from low, medium, or high. And then you can also set the temperature. In the back of the unit is where you'd fill it up with ice and then water. And there's lines on the unit, within the unit, that show you where you should stop putting ice and, and et cetera. Instant cold packs, these contain two chemical bar uh, so chemicals separated from each other by a plastic barrier. You rupture the seal, allowing the chemicals to mix. That's what you squeeze or hit it or whatever you need to do, right? And you can see this one on the lower right has a picture of somebody squeezing it. Low decrease in skin temperature and short duration means short life. Uh, this is convenient to keep in kits if you're traveling for some reason, but... Uh, I don't really ever use these that can be harmful to the skin. You need a barrier with these. Okay. The lowdown. These are questions I would typically ask you in class, but you're virtual right now, right? So in your head, think, what are the indications of cold packs? What are the contraindications of cold packs? What are the precautions of cold packs? Remember, we did this last lecture. What are four primary effects of cold packs? And then how long would we treat a patient? The patient one's interesting because you have to take into account the depth of the tissue you're trying to cool, right? Your goal, essentially, the amount of adipose tissue the patient may have and the type of cold pack you have. Do you only have a chemical pack or do you actually have a slushy ice pack, right? So those are questions you should be thinking about right now in your head. how we set up and app apply ice pack. So again, make sure uh, the patient has no contraindications. You fill the bag with enough ice to last the duration of treatment. You remove excess air from the bag by using the blown suck technique. I don't have an ice bag, unfortunately, here with me, so I can't show you that. But we will do that uh, this summer uh, on campus. And then acute injuries or when compression is desired, you can wet an elastic wrap and apply one layer of compression around the area. I've never really done that. Um, I think now, especially with game ready units and, and whatnot, the, that makes it a little bit easier. If I wanted to do compression with ice, I would use a game ready unit instead of the, the wet elastic, elastic wrap. Um, so I'd place the ice pack on the patient, right? And then wherever the injured area is, and then secure it on with a plastic or elastic wrap, like the saran wrap looking thing, with 30 or 40 millimeters of mercury uh, pressure. Now, how do you know how much pressure that is? I, I don't know, I can't quantify that. Um, but people have done research on that, right? But I cannot quantify that for you. And then you keep in place the determined amount of time that you believe is effective as the clinician, right? Intermittent application is a little different. So we'd apply it for about 10 minutes, remove it for 10 minutes. You may do a cryokinetics, you may do some kind of exercise, and then you reapply it for another 10 minutes, take it off for 10 minutes. You can repeat this for up to about two hours. Um, so research says that there's really little effect on function or swelling, and it can help with control pain, but essentially what you're doing is cooling and rewarming the area. The reusable cold packs, again, no contraindications. You select a pack that's big enough for the area or multiple packs. You definitely cover the skin with uh, a wet towel or elastic wrap because you don't want to burn them. You secure it on for elastic wrap and then you watch for signs of frostbite. Right? If their skin begins to feel tingly, waxy, uh, painful, right? we don't want frostbite. <laughs> that's a lawsuit. Instant cold packs, uh, you can, again, make sure that there are no contraindications. You shake the bag or squeeze the bag, whatever it might be. Look at the bag for the directions, right? Secure the bag in place. If it leaks onto the skin, make sure you wash with water. It would be great if you had a barrier for this one as well, just due to the chemical nature of this type of ice pack or cold pack. 
And then you'd actually dispose of this one after treatment. You would not keep this. Whew. So this is an elastic wrap that this person is wrapping on an ankle. All right, so this is an ice bag. This stuff that looks like saran wrap is essentially that, saran wrap on a roll. And you wrap it on and you can pull it tight and make sure the ice bag's on and the, the student athlete patient can walk to dinner or lunch wherever they're going back to their dorm. They don't have to necessarily stay there physically present to ice. Historically, we may tell people to ice for 20 to 30 minutes, ideally closer to that 20 minute mark because the, you, that chart I showed you where the, the line's going like this with the cold and um, the tissue temperature, really, once you hit that 20 minute mark, everything starts to increase. The tissue temperature starts to normalize, right? So the two uh, temperature gradients are becoming closer to equal. There's a better method. Remember, factor in the target tissues, the depth of those tissues, assess the amount of overlying adipose tissue. So on an ankle, there's not much adipose tissue. There's not much depth, right? It's pretty superficial. So you probably actually don't need to ice the ankle as long as you would maybe a hamstring or a glute. Ice massage. Nobody likes ice massage. I hated having ice massage done to me when I was a baseball player um, back in high school. So ice massage is used to deliver cold treatments to a, a, a small, evenly shaped area. This is most effective in cases involving a muscle spasm or contusion or well-localized pain. If they come in and they say they have pain one spot right in their biceps, it would be good to do an ice massage. You can go in circles. You can dig in. Um, the crazy thing with ice massage is it produces a rapid decline in temperature fast. Rapid is the big thing here. Only when applied to a small area, though. You don't apply this to the whole hamstring, the whole quadriceps, right? That's not the point of an ice massage. Well, you... How do you do an ice massage? You freeze water. They sell these little blue devices. I can't even think of the name of them now. Um, but I typically, in most places, use you know reusable paper cups or the paper cups that you use for like athletic games, Gatorade cups. Uh, you freeze them, tear off the paper, and you massage in essentially. So primary effects is it decreases the pain or can actually cause some pain, right? Because you're going to go through the stages of cold, but decreases pain, breaks that pain, spasm, pain cycle, and decreases the sensitivity of cutaneous nerve receptors or superficial nerve receptors. So if the superficial nerve receptors are have a decrease in sensitivity, that would decrease the pain, which could break their spasm if they're in spasm. Duration, <sighs> anywhere from five to 15 minutes um, in duration. I would say the kind of the gold benchmark uh, that I've noticed in clinical practice and a few research articles is about that seven minute mark is when they go through the stages of cold. So remember, what are the stages of cold again? Yeah, so they're going to go through those stages of cold. And I typically talk to them about what they're going to experience and say to the patient, hey, you're going to experience this, you know, burning sensation, aching, etc. And I want to know when you can't feel anything at all anymore, when you're numb. At that point, I stop, all right? So that's why I communicate with them. Tell them, hey, tell me when you're numb. Awesome, especially their first time having an ice massage. Because it'll hurt a little bit. We'll do this hopefully in this summer. Uh, you guys can torture each other on ice massage. Um, but again, communicating with the patient and knowing when the, they are numb. And that's when you can stop. It's essentially that seven minute mark. So this patient's actually doing their own ice massage. I don't like that. I like doing my own thing, right? I like doing this on the patient. That's why I'm there. In busy environments, if you're at uh, you know high school maybe by yourself, and you have a lot of people coming in at once, them doing the ice massage on themselves may be okay. But in the real world, I don't like that. I know that I live in a fantasy world sometimes and say, uh, you know, I want to do everything myself or, you know, you guys as students can do this. That may not be the case. So again, what do you think are some indications of ice massage, contraindications and precautions? 
they're very similar to ice the only major difference here would be to make sure that very localized area that they're doing the ice massage on does not have any contraindications um, big thing here would be um, sensitized skin, desensitized skin. So if they just had a surgical procedure done or a numbness in an area that they can't feel, might not want to do ice massage on there. Probably actually don't want to do ice massage on there. How to set up ice massage? Well, make sure they have no contraindications. <laughs> make sure the ice is frozen. I say that laugh with a smiley face because there'll be times in a busy environment that you might not be the only uh, clinician in, in the facility, right? that you don't know that the, the patient or the, no, somebody might have just frozen, uh, put some fresh uh, ice cups in the freezer an hour ago and like the outside is frozen but the middle still isn't yet. So when you start doing it on a patient, the whole thing just breaks open after a couple of minutes and leaks everywhere. I've done it. I'm sure you'll end up doing it in your clinical practice. I think most people have done this at some point just because the busyness and the nature of AT. Uh, make sure the treatment area is no larger than two to three sizes of the size of the cup. So smaller areas get colder quicker. Makes sense, right? Larger areas take longer to get cold. But you don't want to go more than two to three times the size of the cup. This way you can get an effective um, massage. Surround with, uh, the, the treatment area with a towel so the water can leak on the towel, right? And then you can slowly massage with overlapping strokes or circles. So you can go straight up and down. You can go in circles, and don't be afraid to put a little bit of pressure between the skin and the ice, right? Um, you may find a spot that they're pretty tender in, or, or sore, or painful in, and you can dig a little bit even in there. And then you remove paper from the cup as it melts. The massaging action assists in decreasing the pain and decreased the spasm. So this stimulates large diameter nerves, and cold activates the ascending pain control mechanism. So this can activate the gate control mechanism of pain, inhibiting transmission of pain. So I guess in your head right now, I've typically asked in class, what is the gate control mechanism again? So in your head, what is the gate control mechanism of pain? So does it make sense by taking that cold ice, rubbing it on whatever injured area, right? The, the pain, we, the ice essentially is stimulating those nerves. What nerves? Hmm and overriding the pain signal going to my substantial gelatinosa in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, right? So again, what afferent nerves are being uh, stimulated? Um, and what nerves, yeah, to, to override the pain signal. When would you use ice massage then? So would you use it on somebody that just tore their ACL? No, no you wouldn't because that's an intra-articular within the joint injury. Would you use it on an ankle sprain? Probably not, same thing, right? So you would wanna use it mainly for strains, contusions, right? So if you have a hamstring strain in one spot, the, the hamstring is very tender. Uh, you just got hit by a pitch in baseball. Um, you get knee during a soccer game in your quad. Pretty common stuff. Ice immersion, again, nobody likes ice immersion. Well, I take that back. Cross country kids seem to always like ice ice immersion. I don't understand that. You know, if any of you guys ran cross country, I'm sorry. I make fun of cross country in here. I think a lot of it is because well, I can't run. So ice immersion is ice slush or ice bath that involves placing uh, the body part into a mixture of ice and water. The temperature ranges between ranges between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This can be unco uncomfortable. The first three minutes or so pain is very intense so yes you're going to have pain while sticking the foot leg arm hand whatever in the ice immersion it remains high for about the first five minutes of the immersion the smaller the diameter of the area the more pain so fingers and toes hurt more than your whole leg from your knee down right does it actually work though there maybe uh, we'll get there so typically we only do ice immersion for about 10 to 15 minutes we don't necessarily want to keep the patient in over 15 minutes because we could risk some frostbite injury again the temperature range is between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit and it's good to know these temperature ranges that I'm talking about 
one, I do put them on tests at times. Two, your national exam, the board certification BOC exam, does put and like these ranges on their exams. Primary effects, so decreases cell metabolism, reduces secondary hypoxic injury, releases uh, and the release of inflammatory mediators. It helps decrease pain and can cause uh, local vasoconstriction. Ice immersion, do you think putting a patient, you know, that's uh, 65 years old that just had a total knee replacement in an ice immersion is smart? No. I don't think that would be the best patient to use that on. What patients would you might maybe use this for? DOMS. What is DOMS? Delayed onset muscle soreness. You can have whole lectures on DOMS, exercise physiology lectures on DOMS. I am not here to go into that. What I will say is there is limited evidence out there for ice immersion and taking away a patient's feeling of muscle soreness. Prior to ankle range of motion after an ankle sprain, that would be a great patient to use this on. Um, a patient that has a uh, soccer kids get this all the time. They, their cleats are always so tight and you know they're playing with a kickball essentially and they get their foot stepped on by another player. Another good person to put this in there in a nice immersion. I wouldn't necessarily use this on an ankle sprain that just happened today. Why? Well, if I stick my foot in the ice water, gravity is going to take that swelling down to my foot. I want to elevate, right? I've seen, I've actually worked with an athletic trainer that recently retired. She was in clinical practice about 35 years that she would put every ankle sprain she had immediately in ice immersion. She swore by it. In my clinical practice and research and just my thought process, I don't think that makes sense because of the um, gravity-dependent position. So again, ice uh, immersion, the intensity is greater with the immersion due to larger surface area exposed. Drop in skin and subcutaneous tissue temperature is way more pronounced than other cold modalities. Again, this is a great way to decrease sensory and motor nerve conduction velocity. What do you think that means? It may increase swelling. Why? Well, I already said that, all right, because of the gravity dependent position. Ooh, that's a leg in, well, it uh, looks like a Rubbermaid tub full of ice and water. Awesome. The issue here, when you set up, make sure obviously they have no contraindications. Prepare the bucket, tub, whatever you're using, but check the temperature. This is the big thing. I don't think many ATs actually check the temperature. A lot of times the temperature gauges that come with the whirlpools, they actually break pretty easily. Um, so having um, a superficial uh, temperature gun is great. Do not continually have the patient immerse and withdraw the body part. Why? That's really a contrast bath, if you, especially if you go heat. Make sure you monitor the patient. They don't like it, especially the first couple times getting in the ice immersion. How long do you perform the treatment? Mm, 10 to 15 minutes max. Uh, I don't even know if I'd last that long. I don't know if I'd do that long. Can they you know, perform range of motion activities in the immersion? Yeah. So even say this patient right now, their leg is in the, the water, right? Their foot's somewhere around here. They could be doing basic range of motion exercises. They could be writing their ABCs in the water. They could be doing gas pedals, so pushing down on the gas and bringing your foot up off the gas, right? Whatever you think is safe for them to do within that. Whirlpools, awesome. Ice immersion is essentially a whirlpool without the whirl effect, right? So whirlpool, you're doing heat or cold, right? This time with whirlpools, we can do hot whirlpools. Hot tub is a hot whirlpool, essentially. 
cold essentially is is an ice immersion but now we're adding a turbine and that whirl effect if you will and the energy is transferred to or from the body by convection so the turbine is a big thing here with a whirlpool it's used to regulate the water flow and amount of air that's introduced into the flow we call that aeration agitation of water so we have an intake this is a turbine down here that's a great circle I just drew um, and you've probably seen these if you've seen a whirlpool within an athletic training facility the top part up here this is top I can't write using a mouse bam looks like a uh, two-year-old wrote that this is the top part the top part will have a button that you turn on and that in turn does a whole lot of stuff with the water take and aeration and provides that bubbly whirlpool effect. The temperatures here are actually very important. Temperatures for hot and cold depends on the proportion of total body area immersed. The cold whirlpool needs to be set between 50 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. 55 is usually a good happy medium. Hot whirlpool needs to be set between 90 and 110 degrees. These temperature ranges are proven in literature for really any therapeutic effect to occur. What are some precautions of hot whirlpools? Well, if a patient is susceptible to heat illness, you don't want to necessarily use the hot whirlpool because you can get pretty hot in these things, right? Little kids, uh, not necessarily want to do a full body immersion in a hot whirlpool because that can actually cause some heat issues. Water immersion is great for active range of motion exercises due to buoyancy, resistance, hydrostatic pressure, which we'll get into a little bit later on in the semester. Buoyancy describes the lifting force or thrust provided by the water. So if the body's specific gravity is equal to that of the water, it floats just beneath the surface. It, in a water immersion is great for reducing the compressive forces on weight bearing joints. So you see a lot of geriatrics or older individuals taking part in um, swimming classes or yoga in the water or, or you know exercise in the water and that's why because it reduces the compressive forces on weight-bearing joints. Most bigger facilities, I'm assuming George Mason actually has this, since you guys are a bigger institution and our uh, Division One institution, have uh, the underwater treadmills, the hydro works that you can get in and uh, use a, a treadmill under the water. And, and you can actually have some cameras and you can see uh, how the person's gait is or their, their walking or running gait, right? And see, um, you should really be able to tell if they're improving that way. Uh, my wife's institution just got donated two Alter G treadmills. So they're these non-weight-bearing treadmills. Essentially, you take uh, gravity out of them. You get like zipped up into this thing and you run on a treadmill. It's crazy. These things cost about $75,000 each. And so my wife works at Williams, which is a uh, very well-known institution. Um, their endowment's about $3 billion. So they get a lot of high-profile students that come here, and a lot of parents donate a lot of money after, right? So this past year, they had a parent that wanted of a cross-country kid that wanted to buy two Alter G treadmills. These things, like I said, $75,000 each. So they're buying them for $150,000 and just donating them to the institution. It's crazy. Anywho, resistance is produced by water's viscosity. So it depends on the speed of the motion and proportion of the body and limb that is immersed. So if you're moving slowly through the water with a hand, right? Versus you're trying to do backhands and forehands like in tennis or swinging a golf club in the water that and you move fast that's going to increase the viscosity and all that right faster motions produce more resistance so typically in a water immersion we go slow to start with basic range of motion and then you can build up you can do plyometrics in the pool there's some crazy things you can do in a pool 
that I, I've done a little bit with, but it, you know, I've been in education so long, and a lot of the institutions I worked at prior to me going straight into teaching, um, didn't really have a lot of pool access. I couldn't really do a lot of things I wanted to because I didn't have the resources. So the whirlpool effects on the injury response cycle, a cold whirlpool will help decrease spasm, muscle spasticity even. Hot whirlpools promote muscle relaxation. Contrast baths, you get in the cold whirlpool for five, then hot whirlpool for five, and you keep doing that for you know three or four cycles. And it's supposed to do that pumping action that decreases, supposedly decreases muscle soreness, lactic acid, right? But there's no research on them. I'll challenge you at the end of this lecture to find some, you'll see. Blood flow, agitation of the water does not increase blood flow. I think a big thing here is that edema formation and reduction. So that gravity dependent position, if you already have edema in the area and you're gravity dependent, you know, your knees bent, your foot's in the water, you're going to have an increase in edema formation due to the hydrostatic pressure and increase in limb volume. Pain control is decreased by these A beta nerve fibers activating the gait control mechanism. There's that A beta I had asked you a bunch of slides ago, right? And whirlpools can actually help increase range of motion. ROM is range of motion. Something we really don't do much in AT and uh, you can use it, but I've never actually done this. You can use a whirlpool to clean wounds. So if you have turf burn, if they have a thermal burn or a pressure wound, you can heat the water to 96 to 98 degrees, so essentially 97 degrees. You add an antibiotic uh, agent to the water. Obviously, you make sure that the whirlpool tub is clean before and after, and then you immerse the body part. I've never done this um, in physical therapy world they probably have and burn units they have AT there's so many different other ways you can you know control the the burn and, and clean out the wound even then putting them in a whirlpool you should really clean the whirlpools daily how many places actually do that I don't know it should be on like your opening and or closing tasks of the day Primary effects. So we talked a little bit about hot cold whirlpools. What are the three primary effects you can think of? Right? We we keep them in the water anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes for a whirlpool. I would even say 10 to 15 minutes. In our text, there's six indications of whirlpools. What are four of them? What about contraindications? There's five listed in the text. What are four of them? And then precautions, there's about eight listed in the text. What are five of them? So these are good to know because they're all very similar, right? All the cold ones are very similar. All the hot ones are very similar. Cold meaning ice pack with whirlpool immersion. Hot meaning moist hot pack and hot whirlpool, hot immersion, which we almost never do uh, with lukewarm water. So you set up. Make sure they have no contraindications, obviously, and make sure they have proper temperature, either cold or hot, depending on which one. They're, this is the same setup. Notice, do not turn on that turbine while in the whirlpool or the body is wet. Something I haven't mentioned yet is these whirlpools should be plugged into something called the GFI, ground fault interrupter. So if there's a surge of electricity, that GFI trips and shuts off power to that whirlpool. It essentially saves you from being electrocuted. So you don't want to be in the water while or before you turn on the turbine. I always turn on the turbine before you get in the water. Also, don't turn on the turbine until the water is filled to the proper depth that is above the turbine because you can actually damage the turbine. So you fill the water to the proper depth, you can add a disinfectant, and that's not always required. Every facility is a little different. Um, and every facility has a different disinfectant. That's why I didn't list this, a specific one here. So when you get to a clinical site or a new job, always make sure you know what their procedures are about the dis disinfectant. And then I always adjust temperature if needed. It might get too hot. It might get too cold. You might have to add a little warm water because you added too much ice. Uh, so I'll add cold water and ice into the cold whirlpool 
to bring the temperature to where I want it. And then sometimes if I don't add enough ice, I need to add more and whatnot. And again, you turn on the turbine, you, you can adjust turbulence, but not every unit you can do that. You allow the patient to get into the whirlpool, monitor them, monitor their temperature. Obviously cold whirlpool, when they get in, the temperature is gonna increase because of that temperature gradient, right? Monitor them. I had one of my classmates at Slippy Rock, actually the girl that was allergic to, cold uh, to ice has cold urticaria, she fainted. She sat up on the bench and put her feet, and actually think it was like from her, uh, from her knees down, and my buddy Yuri and I caught her as she fainted uh, forward. If she would have, uh, if we wouldn't have caught her, she would have fainted right into the water of a whirlpool, which is not very big. Who knows? She could have knocked her head off of something. You know, who knows what would have what would have happened? So especially the first time a patient gets in the whirlpool, you need to monitor them. Anytime you really need to, but that first time they're going through this, you need to. So I've mentioned this before as well, clean before and after treatment or beginning and end of the day, depending on the site. You drain the whirlpool, I, and I'm not going over this in depth because this is depending on the manufacturer and the site that you're at, but you can kind of read through this on your own time. A moist hot pack or moist heat pack, MHP. This is a canvas filled pouch, right? Canvas pouch, I should say, filled with silica or similar substance. They're kept in a water filled heating unit called the hydroculator. And this ranges between 160 and 166 degrees Fahrenheit. It's kept that warm because this can kill the bacteria that may collect in the heating unit. Remember, this is a superficial heating modality used using conduction with moisture. So superficial modality, moist hop pack, conduction with moisture. So it's only about two centimeters deep it goes, right? Superficial modality. So this is a tape measure. So this is two centimeters that I'm holding up right here. From here, my right hand that's moving, to my left hand right here, two centimeters, all right? Bam, not very far. So if you think of a patient that you want to heat their hamstring before they go out to volleyball practice, you put the hot pack on them, bam. That's not very far. By the time it goes through the skin, the fat layer, you might get to the first layer of muscle. If you're heating a glute, say that piriformis, like I said last lecture, there is no way you're getting to the piriformis with a hot pack. No way. You're going more than two centimeters with a moist hot pack, right? So moist hot pack can maintain a temperature range for anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes before putting it, uh, needing to put it back in the heating unit. The thing with moist hot packs, very similar to what I said about uh, the commercial cold packs that the freezer and the PT clinic, same thing with moist hot pack. If you're the first patient in 8 a.m., you get that hot pack on you, it's going to feel nice and warm. Put it back in, it might be in the hydroculator three to five minutes. It will not have a chance to warm up that much, right, back up to the where it should be before you put it on the next patient. Obviously, if you have more hot packs in there, you can take a different one, but understand if you keep using the same hot pack, it will not have the same heating effect. Layering. You should not lay directly on the moist hot pack. You increase the risk of burning the patient themselves, right? And you increase the risk of rupturing that silica material out of the canvas pouch. I have seen them rupture. It's like a clay mud material. It's horrible. I've had them rupture within the hydroculator and that gets everywhere. Um, so don't have them lay on it, place the hot pack on them, and you need to layer it with terry cloth, right? Uh, I don't have that on here. So you need to layer it with, so let me back up. They have cervical and lumbar moist hot packs. The cervical is great for obviously the neck, shoulders, ankles, weird, weird areas that, you know, you, you need to wrap uh, the hot pack around. Lumbar is great for that. What it, what it says, lumbar, the back, um, glutes, hamstrings, quads, uh, stuff like that. But again, you need to place the hot pack from the hydroculator in a terry cover, cloth cover. I said cover a couple times. 
then you can layer it with towels, right? So a lot of times I'll layer it with at least one layer of towel and then give the patient another layer just in case next to them that they can put on or I can put on in case it gets too hot. I will, don't want to burn somebody, right? So the primary effect of a moist hot pack is they increase blood flow, vasodilation essentially, and cell metabolism. And it helps relaxate, right? Relax the taxi. It's a relaxation mechanism. Again, it's stored in 160 to 166 degree uh, Fahrenheit water. And then you can keep it on anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the amount of adipose tissue. Ooh, there are six indications in our books. There are four indi contraindications and four precautions. You notice I'm trying to make you go in your book and read your book. What are some indications, contraindications, and precautions of moist hot packs, heat packs? They are moist hot packs. They are ineffective in increasing subcutaneous tissue temperature. What does that mean? Hmm. In patients with thick adipose tissue, it's a nice way of saying they have some fat on them. Why do we continue to use them? So say the offense alignment, I pick an offense alignment right now. Offense alignment are typically the nicest guys on the football team, like big teddy bears, right? They look big, they look mean, but they're always the super nice guys that do anything for you. Nine times out of ten. But a lot of them have a lot of adipose tissue. That's why they're offense alignment, right? So say you want to heat their glute. Why would you put a hot pack on them? It's not going to get through the fat. Subcutaneous tissue levels, they're ineffective for what is below the fat. Why do we continue to use them? Because that's what's always been done. We learn, yep, you got a tight muscle, your hamstring feels tight, here's a hot pack. Go heat it for 10 minutes, you're going to feel better. Psychologically, maybe, that placebo effect, maybe. Physiologically, no way. No way. All right? You're not going to heat that tissue enough to allow elongation, that plastic deformation. Um, yeah. If there's less adipose tissue, you could maybe get to three centimeters deep. But again, every patient, every time, probably not with all the other variables that come into play. This can cause a rapid increase in tissue temperature of the skin. Obviously, hot on the skin increases tissue temperature. But the muscle relaxation is the biggest benefit to a moist hot pack. Make sure they have no uh, contraindications. You cover the pack with a terry cloth covering. And our book says five to six layers between the pack and the skin on top of the terry cloth. That's not including the terry cloth, right? It's a lot of layers. Whoops, that patient probably will not feel the hot pack at all. Then. Make sure the patient's in a comfortable position. If they're prone or on their stomach, do they have a prone pillow? Um, whatever it might be. I check on the patient after five minutes. I even do it before then. A couple minutes after putting the hot pack on. Hey, is this too warm for you? You doing okay? You falling asleep on me? I usually tell patients, yep, this is your time to nap for 15 to 20 minutes. But uh, again, I never use heat. Uh, actually, in my facility, I treat dancers, right? I, I work with our dance company on campus for five years. I actually do not have a hydroculator with moist hot packs. I have no hot. And I have no cold. I have no ice machine or uh, hot packs in my facility. It's crazy. I use my two hands in some of the modalities. Exercise. That's it. This is a hydroculator. Come in various sizes and, and whatnot. This is a pretty standard size of a hydroculator. Uh, to maintain this, again, it's going to be a diff, little bit different per company. Um, so the hot pack actually sits within here, the hydroculator, this is what gets filled with water. They can get pretty grimy and pretty dirty. Um, I don't think anyone ever cleans these bi-weekly. I'd say most institutions I've worked at, even though we have every intention of cleaning these things every other week, you just don't, you, it just falls, you know, it's one of those things that falls by the wayside because you get busy. So I know at the end of every semester at least we clean these things, um, but ideally it would be every, you know, couple weeks they do actually make newer hot packs that you can put in here but do not require terry cloth covering one of our clinical sites up in vermont actually has uh the newer hot packs and they're interesting i don't know if i like them or not the student athletes patients seem to like them but i'm not sure on them yet i don't know enough about them yet 
but you can read this again on your own time because this is going to depend per facility as well. Paraffin bath. Paraffin bath is essentially a superficial heating agent for tr heating and treating small irregularly shaped areas, your hands, your feet. It literally looks like it's, it's a mixture of wax and mineral oil. Um, and I hate these things because when student athletes, patients see these in an athletic training facility, they're like, oh, I'm going to dip my hand in here. And it makes your skin nice and soft, right? Like you're getting a manicure or pedicure. I've never had one, but that's what I've been told. And patients always just want to come in and play with the thing. So I've actually gotten rid of the paraffin bath. Um, at the last facility I worked at, I worked football before I got to my current position. I taught, I was a clinical coordinator, and I taught, or I worked football at a Division II institution in, in West Virginia. And the paraffin bath, that's all that people would do. They'd come in and play with it. So I chucked it. We didn't chuck it, we put it in storage, but we got rid of it away from people. We never used it, and people just played with it. Okay. May increase intraarticular temps about 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I have a finger, bam, basketball to the finger, I sprain this joint press this joint. I have issues moving it. I can heat it using a paraffin bath about 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit. It may increase the temperature of that so I can then do range of motion easier. Right? Makes sense. Temps for UE and LE. UE is upper extremity. LE is lower extremity. Slightly different. Right? Upper extremity 118 to 126 degrees Fahrenheit and lower extremity 113 to 121 degrees Fahrenheit for the paraffin. Pretty hot. This is a picture of a paraffin bath. Essentially, you, whoop, my pen's not up. Essentially, you open the top up here, and then within the unit in here, you put these blocks of wax. That is wax and mineral oil and some other things, and plug it into the wall, and the wax melts. It's like a fondue. If you've ever made fondue, you add cheese, and the cheese melts and gets all, yeah. Essentially what this is. But you can't eat this stuff. Uh, and they get gross, like there's hair in there from people's hands and feet, and uh, yeah, I don't like, yeah. I think the, the negatives outweigh the benefits on paraffin baths. Increased perspiration, blood flow, and some metabolism to the area. Uh, but again, I never use these things. The proper way to do a, a, a paraffin bath immersion is wash the body part prior to the paraffin. Makes sense. Wash your hands. Soap and water. Feet, soap and water. Make sure they don't have contraindications. Those that skipped past that last slide were contraindications. Hmm. So this one for the immersion, you spread the fingers or toes. Stick your hand. I'll use my hand as an example. Stick your hand into the paraffin, cover the, the whole area. You dip the body part in the paraffin, remove it, allow it to dry. Dip it in, dry. Six to 12 times, dip it in, allow it to dry. Awesome. Place uh, part back into paraffin for the duration of the treatment. So essentially, I'm dipping and pulling my hand out of the hot paraffin. Six to 12 times. Once I do that, once I get a good coating, I dip it back in. Essentially, I'm trying to provide like an insulator level for the heat, right, by dipping it in six to 12 times. Instruct them to avoid touching the sides or the bottom because you can get burned. Don't move the joints because that cracks the paraffin. After treatment scrape off the paraffin discard it don't put it back in there i have seen clinics people ats at other facilities put the paraffin back in there now you got all their hand junk whatever was on their hand even though they should have washed it but probably didn't unless you watched them and took them and held their hand and did wash it with them now you have all their hand gunk back in that paraffin for the next patient gross the glove pack method, I think, is more common. This is the one I've actually used for some hand therapy. So again, AT, we use this a little bit, but PT will use this because PT, physical therapy, they have specializations in hand therapy. So you can become a certified hand therapist if you're a PT. Again, no contraindications. You make sure the hands or toes are spread. You dip in. Why 7 to 12 times? Don't know. Do 6 to 12 it's, I know why it's, uh, we're doing the dipping. I'm saying, why is this different than the immersion method? 6 to 12 in the immersion, 7 to 12 for the glove pack. Do it 6 to 12 times, right? After final withdrawal, so you dipped and, and whatnot out of there 12 times, cover your hand with a plastic ice bag. 
So you cover the hand with an ice bag, you tape it on. So essentially that heat is uh, perspiring and, and, and heating the area. And then you wrap it with a t cloth or a towel around the area. So this is, you can kind of tell, might be better on the PowerPoint version, only version without me talking. All these fingers are waxy. There's a wax line up to about here. All this is covered in paraffin. That's the paraffin. It just looks like water, but it's hot. It's waxy, all right, mineral oil. So they didn't put the ice bag on them yet. They're going to wrap themselves up in the towel, and they put like a rubber band around it, and that's what provides heat. It is actually pretty good for small areas like a hand, finger injuries, thumb. Um, you have a ligament right here in your thumb called the ulnar collateral ligament, gamekeeper's thumb. You see that a lot. Um, and then you do have ligaments on each side here between each joint. So if you do sprain a finger, common in basketball, soccer, right? The, this paraffin bath actually can help. Okay. Contrast therapy consists of alternating hot and cold treatments. I don't like this one. Thought to cause a cycle of vasoconstriction, then vasodilation of superficial blood vessels. There is no physiological or scientific evidence that this works. Same goes with decreasing pain. So why do we do it? It's what's always been done. AT is huge. Athletic training AT, right, is huge on, well, this is what my AT did back in high school. This is what the mentor I had did, and they've been in clinical practice 30 years. Who cares? That's what I, that's what I always say. Who cares? Is it the best thing to actually do just because they do it that way? Does that actually make sense? So you're telling me by heating it, vasodilating it for five minutes, then constricting it for five minutes, then vasodilating it for five minutes is actually going to cause us pumping action in the blood to produce a physiological effect of decreasing the edema in the area, let's say. Now, physiologically, can we heat that area enough to a therapeutic level that actually does cause vasoconstriction? Okay, maybe we can. Then we place them in the cold whirlpool, ice immersion. Can we now go from the, I don't know, 110 degrees, if, if that body part's 110 degrees, back down to 57, 58 degrees essentially within five minutes? No. Remember, the greatest amount of analgesia or pain is about 58 degrees. The greatest amount of compression or vasoconstriction is about 57, 58 degrees. So can we actually go from like 110 to 58 degrees? Can we essentially go, you know, 40 plus the minus degrees in five minutes? No. And now that we go back in the hot whirlpool, maybe that superficial body part is, I don't know, let's say 60 degrees. But the internal body temperature might be a little colder. Let's say that's 56. Yeah, let's say it's 60. Can we go from 60 back up to 100 degrees? I don't think so. Just physiologically, it can't vasoconstrict and dilate. And remember that hunting response. What happens after about 5 to 10 minutes of cold? Hunting response. Remember, vasoconstriction is occurring first couple minutes, 5 minutes, and then bam. Increase in tissue temperature and blood flow, the va or the hunting response. So things that were now vasoconstricted now vasodilate because of the hunting response. What are your thoughts? Have you seen contrast therapy, contrast baths? Do you use them? Have you used them as a as a student athlete? I have uh, seen them used at certain clinical sites that you know I go out and visit. And I think more and more of my preceptors are buying into that these don't really do anything. And the research and evidence-based uh, medicine practice out there. Okay, review. Picking the best thermal modality for each patient is really dependent upon your goals and their go goals and where they are within the injury cycle. Use the evidence at hand. These are superficial modalities. Remember, superficial, two centimeters. Break out my, my uh, measuring tape here, two centimeters. Ultrasound and diathermy, and some things we'll talk about later, could go from two to six centimeters, so about that 
much penetration, which is good. It's about two and a half inches. That's what. That's good. Yeah. Use common sense too, though. There's no evidence for contrast bats. I challenge you to find support for it. Peer-reviewed support. Just don't go Google it and find some Joe Schmo out there that's a cross-country coach and thinks, yep, contrast bass are the best thing since contrast bass. Don't do that. If there's peer-reviewed evidence out there, find it. Email it to me. That's awesome. I want to know if there's new stuff out there. I can't keep up to date on every single piece of literature and every single uh, intervention, right? Okay, so essentially that ends this thermal modalities section. What we need to do now is you need to make sure you read or have read through Josh Stone's uh, blog articles, which hopefully you have. And then you need to make sure you're answering the questions on the discussion boards. Uh, I believe they're discussion board two and three this week. You'll have two quizzes that you need to complete and then your exam. All right. So your exam will consist of all material up until this point. Um, I actually think I'm going to put another lecture up that will talk about compression, so like the game ready units and some things, uh, the physiology behind that as well. Um, so look for that uh, up later this weekend uh, for the week two of your AT uh, 320 and 520 courses. Again, hopefully things are going well. I know uh, the last chapter, the science physiology, if you will, behind uh, the modalities can be a little more challenging than this chapter. This chapter is really, you need to do it. I'm a hands-on learner. I need to get in the lab or the athletic training facility clinic and do these things on each other. At least I, I did it when I was a college student, and I think you guys will as well. So a lot of these things we talked about in this chapter, I kind of flew through because when we get on campus in, in August, we're going to do a lot of these things hands-on on each other. Uh, it'll be a couple, you know, three busy days worth of info, but I think it'll be good. I think it'll be really good info. Um, and they're all very similar. Make sure the patient's set up properly, no, no contraindications, and bam. Let's do the intervention on them. Again, email me, text me, call me. People do still use phones to call people. Um, if you do have any questions.